We're going to be in Micah chapter 6 today, verses 1 through 8. And once again, we have a tandem of questions that seem to work really well. Um, the source material for today comes from the topic, was Micah chapter 6, verse 8, was the request. Why? Because it's my life verse. So we better do good justice to this one today. And the second topic was about pride and humility, because pride is something we all struggle with. with. So Micah 6, 8, the last part of that says we need to walk humbly with our God. So today, as we discuss pride and humility, as we consider our own hearts, we're going to take this in, uh, front section of Micah chapter 6, because it gives us a running start into our topic today. And three big points we want to remember as we look at this is number one, it's the revelation of the heart of God. What does God want from us? What do you want from me, God? And we're going to get that question answered today. Two, we're going to see humility on display. And three, we're going to talk about how we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. Before we read, let's talk briefly about who Micah is. Micah was the prophet during the reign of King Hezekiah and the king both right before and right after him. Hezekiah, we are told in the prophet Jeremiah, actually listened to Micah and humbled himself in the Lord's sight to avoid disaster. Now, we know that Hezekiah's life actually ended in pride, so he didn't keep listening. That should be a note to us. Listen to God and keep listening to him. And so he has a word for us to respond to. And so he actually lets the people have a, a say in some of his prophecy here too. We'll hear that. So let's dive right in. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, says this. Now listen to what the Lord is saying. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your complaint. Listen to the Lord's lawsuit, you mountains and enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people, and he will argue it against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? Or how have I wearied you? Testify against me. Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from that place of slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam ahead of you. My people, remember what King Balak of Moab proposed, what Balaam, son of Baor, answered him, and what happened from the Acacia Grove to Gilgal, so that you may acknowledge the Lord's righteous act. What should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, with year-old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousand streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the offspring of my body for my own sin? Mankind, he has told each of you what is good. And what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's talk about the revealed heart of God. First, we have the willingness of God to engage with his people. It might be a rhetorical question, but it's a question all the same. God asks, how have I wronged you? Come. And testify against me. This is the court case that Job longed for. His whole lament. He just said if God would just let me talk to him. Here God tells the people do. Come and talk to me. And let's see what comes of it. We have the reminder of the deliverance of God. From the Acacia Grove to Gilgal, remember what happened. So I had to go back and actually look up, well, what did happen between the Acacia Grove and Gilgal? Well, if we go back to Joshua, the Acacia Grove is where he stationed right before crossing the Jordan River and where he sent out his spies to go out and to look at the promised land and where the people responded faithfully. 
And then they miraculously cross the Jordan as it piles up and they cross on dry ground, reminiscent of the Red Sea. And then Gilgal is where they stage, right? It's just north of Jericho. And this is where they stage before storming Jericho as God commands them to do in a miraculous way. So God is saying to them, remember how I provided for you. Remember how I brought you in. And these other two references here, remember what Balak of Moab proposed and what Balaam, son of Beor, what happened or how he answered him. If we remember, Balak gathered up uh, see, Balak gathered up Balaam and said, come and curse Israel for me because they're on my doorstep and I want them gone. And Balaam said, what can I do but what God puts in my mouth? And even if you offered me a household of silver and gold, I wouldn't come. And so Balak says, I'll give you that. And Balaam said, I'm on my way. And so he has him set up a multiple times and in multiple situations, offer sacrifices and says, now curse him. And Balaam opens his mouth and blesses Israel over and over again until Balak's just disgusted and said, your God robbed you of your reward. You blessed them. I wanted them cursed. Now go away. And they were blessed indeed. Remember how God turned the desired curse into a blessing for you on your behalf. Folks, this is what is true for us today. There was one who wants you cursed, Satan the accuser, and how God turned that into blessing. Jesus became a curse on the cross, became sin on the cross, and what Satan intended for evil, just like it has been said in the past, so God intended it for your good. So remember, this is the first step into humility. Remember what God has done. And the people respond with contempt. They say, would God ever be satisfied? Thousands of rams. 10,000 streams of oil. Is that what you want, God? Do you want me to give you my kids? Do you want them sacrificed? They are just disgusted with the thought of God. Why the contempt? This here is pride on display. The refusal to see that even if God did ask for those things, it would be His right. Because it's all His. We hear it in the Psalms. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So if God said, give it all to me, he would just simply be saying, give me what's mine. Give me my due. But he's gracious, he's loving, he does not do that. As for child sacrifice, isn't that what gets Israel ultimately kicked out of the land? God says, well, that didn't even cross my mind that you would want or do such a thing. So here, they respond with pride, saying, not recognizing that everything is God's, refusing to hand it over. And pride is the sin of elevating ourselves too highly, thinking more of ourselves than we ought to. A lower form of pride could be in, I don't need people. You've heard this. I can handle my problems on my own. I don't need anybody's help. I can do church by myself in nature. Anybody ever heard that? I don't need to go to church. I can, I can do church all by myself. And I never need any help. Never need anybody's support. That's a lower level of pride. A higher form of pride is I don't need God. I can work out my own salvation. I'm good enough. I'm a good guy. I can handle this stuff. I can do this stuff. And an inverted form of this kind of pride is I'm too bad for God. God could never forgive me. The church would burst into flames if I walked through the front door. Like, really? I'd be interested to see that happen. <laughs> Either way, whether we say I'm too good for God or too bad for God, we're putting ourselves above the reach of God. Humility then it's not quite the opposite of pride because it's, 
Pride is thinking too high of yourself. The opposite is thinking too low, and that's not humility. Humility is thinking rightly of yourself, not badly. A few examples. Let's say you work really hard on a project, and someone compliments you and says, that was a good job, you did well on that. Would you say a humble response is, oh, it was nothing? That's not how humility. Humility is to say, thank you, I worked hard on that. Praise God he let me have success. That is a humble response. If you see a need and you don't fill it because you say, oh, they don't need my help. I wouldn't want to give my talents to that. Is that a humble response? Isn't humility rather to offer up the talents that God has given you in the way that he wants you to do it? We, don't, we often mistake humility with thinking, oh, I'm just scum, I'm just slime, I'm nothing, I'm worthless. Humility is to say, well, I was those things, but God saved me. I'm a child of God. I am worthwhile and have meaning in His hands. But we have to be in His hands to have that kind of purpose and that kind of meaning. You know, a hammer just lying on the bench is an inherently useless tool. You have to be able to pick it up and use it. You have to know what to do with it. So with this in mind, let's go back and let's look at what the Lord requires. Verse 8. To act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Hosea 6.6 6 says, I desire mercy not sacrifice. That's God's own words. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This is quoted by Jesus. Jesus has just been having a meal with tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors and sinners, how gross. Would you invite an IRS agent into your home? I mean, maybe you should, Alvin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the Pharisees go to the disciples and say, what is your master doing with these kinds of people? Now Jesus hears it, and he responds. And he says to them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I desire mercy. All of this points us to the revealed heart of God. The people ask, what kind of sacrifice would you be satisfied with? What do you want from me? And God's response is, I don't want your sacrifice. I want your love and your obedience. I want you. When we go to the, uh, to the reason for these sacrifices in the first place, it's because people messed up. They were sin offerings. They were different kinds of offerings that I did bad. I got to bring the offering and make it right. And so, God is right to say, I don't really want that at all. I'd rather you didn't need an offering to begin with. I want your love and I want your obedience. I want your mercy. And humility on display, Jesus is the perfect example of what that looks like. If you'd open with me in your, if you have your scriptures out to Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes this wonderful, beautiful poem in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. We are told, I just want you to see this. We want to read this together. Philippians 2, verse 5. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. And just think about that for a second. If I was the psalmist, I would say, Selah, pause and reflect on what you've just heard. He did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, 
so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can you believe it? He did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Take on the same attitude of Christ, we're told. What is the other example of perfect submission in the life of Jesus? It's the foot washing in John 13. When he kneels down and he washes the feet of the disciples. It was a job for the lowest servant, the slave. Some folks even said at that time the people who washed feet were subhuman. They, were, they weren't even, they didn't have souls at all. But Jesus took on that role and said, think about what I've done for you. You don't get it now, but you will get it later. Paul, he was a genius. He said, I have resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. He was on his way probably to become the high priest. And his intellect was staggering. But he said, I forsook it all. Everything that I had is worthless. I only know Christ and Him crucified. Humility was to set aside His version of knowledge and to take up Christ. Isaiah, the prophet, was commanded to go naked for three years. Could you even imagine? I can't. I can't imagine. That was the command of God. Go naked to show the desolation that is coming on the people. Jonah was sent to a people he hated. He didn't want to go. He had to be humbled. Humble yourself or be humbled. Those are the options God gives us. Ezekiel had to cease speech itself. He couldn't talk unless God spoke through him. And he had to perform out these acts of God's judgment. Ezekiel, the premier performance prophet, the things that God asked him to do, astounding. Astounding. Jeremiah had to go preach destruction. He didn't want to. He tried to quit. He said, I don't want to say it, but it burned in my bones. I had to get it out. All of these men, including Jesus as a man, had to walk humbly. They had to submit their concept of themselves and to think rightly of themselves. And to think rightly of yourself means to remember that you are a servant of the God Most High. As servants, as tools, as agents, as ambassadors of God, all those concepts remind us that our inherent value is effectively zero. Your value comes from the one who infuses you with his Holy Spirit and who calls you to be his instrument. That means that you have to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself. Or, as we said before, be humbled. How do you humble yourself? How do you go about that process? This is something that I think is very Difficult, especially for us Americans. We don't want to humble ourselves. We, we have this kind of cultural tendency to be built up. Up until very recently, I mean, America, and I think America still is the best nation in the world. Where else could you go? Uh, there was a young gal, uh, Brittany Griner, learned this lesson. There was a report that she stood for the flag at her latest basketball game she was a part of she had been a flag kneeler now she's a flag stander after 10 months in a russian detention camp she said i've learned to love america we should learn to love our god and to stand up for him so to humble yourself number one is to pray to god to reveal your points of pride where is it that i resist his leading where is it that i don't want to walk after him and then we take those to the altar. We have a great song that says, we bring the sacrifice of praise. In what way is praise a sacrifice? Because to praise God means that I want to do it His way 
and not my own way. And after we pray, and after God reveals things to us, we have to walk in obedience. But God's not a puppeteer, and we're not marionettes. He doesn't make us move along. You have to walk in obedience. You have to do it. This is the action component of our faith. God does the saving, and then he says, now go and work out your salvation. That's what Paul says. Work out your own salvation. James says, show me your faith by your works. Humility is to not do what I want, but to do what God wants me to do. And to do what God wants me to do, I have to constantly be praying, reading his word, being in church, hearing encouragement from other believers. He has told each one of you what is good. He doesn't want the sacrifices. So you might say in our sense today, if I just give enough money to the church, God will be pleased with me. If I fast often, God will be pleased with me. If I do all these things, God says that's not where my pleasure is. Folks, at the end of the day, he wants us to be faithful to what he's asking us to do. And if to, to sound like a broken record, the number one thing that God has asked us to do is to advance his kingdom, to go out and press it out. So your jobs are to live like Christians. We just talked about this in Sunday school. I, I love it. To live like Christians. Your life has to reflect your faith, number one. If your life is not reflective of what you profess to believe in here, and hey, that's a dangerous part of singing worship songs, isn't it? You make claims to God. Your grace is enough for me, is it? I mean, is God's grace enough for you to go out and declare his goodness to others? Do we say that we want to praise God from whom all blessings flow? Is that true? If so, the highest praise to God is to go out and do what he's told us, to ask what he's asked us to do. Folks, we need to be a humble church, a church on our knees, a church that puts no stock in ourselves, but rather we are going to walk completely with God all the days of our life that he gives us on this earth. And when we do that, let's pray that he would let us see the fruit of those labors and to always go forward. And I'll just say it one more time as a way of closing. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord so that he doesn't have to humble you. (laughs) 